Next strategy we're going to work with for solving limits is factoring. Now, I'm going to explain the strategy by just getting right into the example. So let's take this first example. The limit as x approaches negative 3 of the function x squared minus 4x minus 21 all over x plus 3. Now, the first thing you always want to check with limits is if you can make a direct substitution. Because if you can do that, then all you have to do is just get that y value and that's what the limit is equal to. But notice in this case how if we plug in negative 3 for x into this expression, the denominator would be 0. So we can't do that because the function is undefined at that point. So let's maybe try to factor everything and see if anything cancels out and then maybe make a direct substitution with that remaining expression. So if you notice, the numerator can factor into x minus 7, x plus 3. And it's still all over x plus 3. And now notice how the x plus 3's cancel out. So we're left with the limit as x goes to negative 3 of x minus 7. And now notice with the remaining expression, we can make that substitution of negative 3 for x. So negative 3 minus 7 would give us negative 10. So that is our final answer. The limit as x approaches negative 3 of this expression is equal to negative 10. So how does this look like graphically? Well, if we take this expression and graph it, because we factored it and this factor of x plus 3 cancel out, we know that there's a hole at x equals negative 3. And it's just a line x minus 7. So that's this line here, but at this x value of negative 3, there's this hole there. But the y value of this hole is negative 10 because if we plug in negative 3 as we did here, we get that value of negative 10. So the limit of this function here, which is this here, graphed, if we approach that x value of negative 3 from both sides, we're approaching that y value of negative 10, even though the function is undefined at that x value of negative 3. There's a hole there. But as we've mentioned, a function doesn't have to be defined at a certain point for the limit to exist there because it's all about the y value that the function is approaching. And that's the same pattern that you're going to run into for any example for which you use factoring when you're finding the limit. When you factor expressions and you cancel out terms, basically at that term what's going to happen is whatever the function looks like, there's going to be a hole at that x value that you canceled out. So the function is not going to be defined at that point, but it's going to approach a certain y value. And to get that y value, you can just plug that x value into that remaining expression. So that's the same pattern that's going to follow in the rest of the example. So it's not always going to be smooth that you're going to get a nice function as x minus 7, which is just a straight line. Sometimes your remaining function can be a quadratic or even another reciprocal function. But the point is, no matter what the function is, at that x value, it's going to be a whole. So it's going to approach a certain y value. And the way to get that y value, just plug it into that remaining expression. Moving on to the second example, we have the limit as x approaches 2 of the function x cubed minus 8 all over x squared minus 4. First thing you always check with limits, can you make a direct substitution? And if we substitute 2 for the x values, we'll get the limit in indeterminate form. So we'll have 0 at the top and 0 at the bottom, and we can't be dividing by a 0. So there's another strategy that we have to undertake in order to get this limit. But if you notice, we can factor both the numerator and the denominator. The numerator is a difference of cubes, so that would factor into x minus 2 and then x squared plus 2x plus 4. And the way we got that was through these formulas. So just a little review from advanced functions. If you don't remember these, you may want to write them down because you will be running into them. So this is the difference of cubes formula and this is the sum of cubes formula. So for the x cubed minus a, we applied the difference of cubes formula. And then the denominator is just a difference of squares, so x minus 2, x plus 2. And then notice how those x minus 2 factors cancel out, and we're left with this equivalent expression. And now notice how we can make a direct substitution for 2. So if we substitute 2 for x, we would have 2 squared plus 2 times 2 plus 4, which would give us 12 in the numerator. And then 2 plus 2 is 4 in the denominator. 12 divided by 4 would give us a final answer of 3. 
So the limit of this expression here is equal to three. Now going into a little bit more detail of what it means when we canceled out that term x minus two, it basically means that there's a hole at an x value of two for this function. And we can graph this function by just graphing this simplified function that we got here and putting a hole at x equals two. Now, just by looking at this, I don't know fully how this graph is going to look like. I know there's going to be a vertical asymptote at negative two, and there's also going to be an oblique asymptote because the degree of the numerator is greater than the denominator by one. But that's not what this unit is about. We already did that when we graphed rational functions and advanced functions. But what I do know is that no matter how this graph looks like, at an x value of two, there's going to be a whole for this function. So at this x value of two, the function is undefined because there's a hole, but as we approach that x value of two, the y value of this hole is going to be three. So that's why the limit as x approaches two of this function is equal to three. Even though it's undefined at that point, there's a hole there, so it's approaching a certain y value, and the y value it approaches is three, and we got that by substituting the value of two in this simplified expression. Moving on to the third example, we got the limit as x approaches a of x plus five a squared minus 36 a squared all over x minus a. Now, this is sort of a weird limit that we're dealing with because we're dealing with two variables now, but uh, let's try to work it anyway. So first thing you always check, direct substitution. Can we sub in a for x? Well, if we sub in a for x, notice how the denominator is going to be zero because we'll have a minus a. So we can't do that. So let's maybe try to factor it. Now, looking at this, your first reaction might be to perhaps foil this bracket, simplify it, and then see if we can factor the numerator. And that would be correct. That's one way to do it. But if you notice, this also resembles a difference of squares. And we know that a difference of squares resembles this general format here, a squared minus b squared equals a minus b times a plus b. So notice how this first term here is like your a squared, and then this whole term here is like your b squared. So what we have to do to factor it is we have to take the square root of that a squared and b squared to get our values for a and b just by themselves. So if we do that, the square root of x plus 5a squared is just x plus 5a, and the square root of 36a squared is just 6a. So we would have that the square root of that first term minus that second term, which resembles this, a minus b, and then we would be multiplying it by the square root of that first term plus the square root of that second term, which represents this or resembles this bracket, a plus b. And then notice how we can simplify that first bracket. We could take the 5a and subtract the 6a and we would just get minus a. So that first bracket uh, simplifies to x minus a. And then this second bracket here simplifies to x plus 11a. And now notice how these x minus a's cancel out. So we're just left with the limit as x goes to a of x plus 11a. And now we can directly substitute a for x. So if we do that, we'll have a plus 11a, which would give us 12a. So that there is our final answer. That is the limit for this whole expression as x approaches a. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this question, another way you could have done it is foiled out this bracket. So x plus 5a times x plus 5a, and you would have ended up with x squared plus 10ax plus 25a squared, and then you're still subtracting that 36a squared. And then at this point, this 25a squared and then this 36a squared, those would net out to negative 11a squared. So you'd have x squared plus 10ax minus 11a squared, and then that would factor into this, and then the x minus a's will cancel out and you would get the same answer. Either way works. I would think that this is a more proper way. This is probably the way your teacher would wanna see it. But in the end, if you end up getting the same answer, I guess it's all good.
So this one is probably one of the tougher uh, factoring type of limits that you'll get, uh, but it's very possible that you might get a limit with multiple variables in the expression. So make sure you do a couple of examples where you're comfortable doing that. There should be a couple in your book. But uh, overall, that's how factoring works. The first thing you always want to check, can you make a direct substitution? If you can't, because the denominator is equal to zero, what you want to do is factor everything if possible, see if stuff cancels out, and then sub in that x value for your simplified expression. Yo, what's up guys? Thanks for checking out my channel. Hopefully you got some value from the video you just watched. If you did get some value, big favor to ask you, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. Any questions, any recommendations on things you'd like to see, please leave it in the comments section. Also check out the description box below for links to material and content related to the video you just watched. Peace out.